our institution. And it's an honor to be standing in front of you. And uh, I have a very interesting life. If I could share a little bit of nugget uh, of my life with you and inspire you to do something, then I guess it would be a very happy moment for me to know about it later. So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about my company, about what we do. And I will also talk to you about, uh, you know, about the future that we're trying to create. And uh, it will be my hope and my wish that, uh, you know, if you could also take up something like this, uh, like what we do, then it might be easier for us to realize the dream that healthcare would be made available to everybody. Okay? So, yeah, so this is me, I just skipped this. Embarrassing. So, oh, yes. And uh, so I have about, before I started my own company, I had worked for about 19 years in IT. And uh, I, uh, I freelanced a little bit and I joined Infosys. I was there for about nine years, almost nine years. And I was in Ernst & Young as an assistant director. I moved over to Sapien and then Virtusa for some time as a director of user experience. And then I finally found my calling, met my company. I was in core IT for all these many years, but I studied arts. Okay, I studied pure arts and uh, I didn't realize it at that point in time, but I'm a pure techie, so it interests me and that's how I kept moving on. And uh, the first lesson from my life to everybody is that it doesn't matter what you study, if you have a good goal and vision, you can achieve it, whatever whatever you have said. It doesn't matter, the grades, the marks, and nothing matters at the end. What matters is what steps you take to realize that dream. Okay, and that's exactly what I did. And um, I had no intention of starting a company at this age in my life. And, uh, you know, my son had epilepsy. We were trying to find a solution. Uh, for it. Uh, his kind of epilepsy was such that, uh, you know, whenever he would have an attack, uh, he had to be rushed to hospital. It would not stop on its own and it would become a life-threatening event. So we would have about 20 to 40 minutes to take him to hospital and uh, immediately he would be rushed into IT ICU. Now, uh, how many of you have seen uh, seizures, epilepsy? Not many? Okay. Now, if you have not seen it, then uh, let me tell you that, you know, it's like epilepsy, you know, is a condition, it's a chronic neurological condition uh, that uh, is related to abnormal electrical activity in the brain, okay? And uh, it is like a short circuit in the brain when the neurons misfire. And uh, in some people, it could manifest as a simple, uh, you know, blink of an eye. It could be a little bit of a disorientation for some amount of time. It could be like that. But for some email, uh, people, the most common type is that, you know, they would have uncontrollable jerkings and movements and they would fall down unconscious, prodding and all of that. And then uh, probably they will get out of that situation after some time. Now there is this type of epilepsy called non-convulsive refractory epilepsy. It is a hard to treat epilepsy and it is, uh, you know, it is difficult to detect. And it could be because it is difficult to detect and it is like it happens for over, over a long period of time. It is uh, many times it is life threatening and people who have this type of epilepsy also have other related problems, mostly like uh, you know, uh, cognitive decline, they would have problems with their vision, learning disabilities, walking, mobility issues and stuff like that. Okay, so my son uh, had that kind of epilepsy where he would have one attack and we had to rush him to the hospital. And going to ICU is difficult once. You know, going to the ICU many, many times is worse. It's a, it's a very depressing place, right? So it was taking a toll on our life and uh, I was working, my husband was working, and my child would be at home with his grandmother, and I would constantly worry if uh, something happened to him, and we are not able to take him to the hospital in time, what happens? But that was a very scary scenario for me, and that would weigh very heavily on me all the time. I was not able to come out of it. What happens? Okay, and apart from that, you know, he was also, uh, 
definitely having uh, issues, uh, uh, development and growth issues, because he had very severe kind of epilepsy. It was impacting every part of his brain. And so he was definitely having these uh, developmental issues. And that was another thing that used to uh, uh, scare me a lot. He, what happens, first of all, he's having these kind of attacks. And secondly, you know, he's also not uh, developing like a normal child of his age. So what is his future going to be like, right? So that used to be there at the top of my mind. And I would say that was uh, the seed, that was the thing that, you know, kind of took me towards a part of research about epilepsy. And uh, we, I have not come across uh, anybody with epilepsy in my family, I have not seen it, never dealt with such a person. And suddenly in a rush, I was trying to, you know, as a parent, I was try I was required to do something to make sure that his life was safe, number one, and number two, to make sure that the child is developing in a way in which he could manage himself independently in the future. So that was like a problem. And then, um, so I was trying to understand what this disorder is uh, from uh, different perspectives, like uh, from a growth perspective, from a safety perspective, from trying to understand what exactly happened to the brain, which means a biological perspective, all of that, okay? And I was trying to understand, uh, you know, if it was possible to predict an attack. And what I learned about epilepsy is that, you know, if you could stop or abort the attacks, the quality of life of the person with epilepsy becomes better, okay? And if we, for example, if we keep aborting these attacks, so they are about to come, we stop it, we keep stopping it, stopping it, the person's brain, the person's brain gets freed up and to engage in other developmental activities. So what I was trying to do was to figure out if there are such solutions available that will help us to stop or abort his attack before they become life threatening. Now if they keep happening over and over again, it is like, uh, you know, Keeping, uh, keep, uh, it's like giving fuel to a fire that is already on, right? So the friction makes the you know damage in the brain worse and worse. Okay, so when he started having his attacks, they were just uh, minor jerks. Doctors were not able to identify what was happening to him, and then it progressed into you know bigger jerks and bigger events, and then finally. Uh, it became these life-threatening events. And so it was very difficult for me to uh, kind of uh, cope with this, all these changes that were happening in my life. I took a reading about these things. I tried to understand if there are certain devices available in the market, what kind of research has been done. And what I found out was that, you know, there are uh, devices that are out there that have been, that are coming out, that were there in the United States, in, in Europe, some parts of Europe. But uh, these devices many times are not practical. Like there are mattresses available with sensors on it. And these mattresses, even if I were to import these mattresses from somewhere, these mattresses are not good enough because the person, if you are assuming that the person is sleeping all the time, and then they even pick up small signals like a truck going on the road. And in India, the houses are so close by, there are a lot of activities happening in the next house. The mattress might think that, you know, he's having a seizure. So the chances of these uh, false alarms were very high, so they were not practical. So, uh, and there were also some uh, you know, variable devices that were coming up and uh, uh, after studying them, I studied, I went, I studied the devices that were already there in the market and what I found out about there was that, you know, they, they, were, uh, they, were, they were generalizing more to come up with assumptions about epilepsy than actually doing proper research and then giving, giving an outcome or a result, okay? And I realized that that kind of a thing, a device that is not really accurate, might actually end up being more harmful for my child and for others also, right? So that was not something that we could really, you know, take up. So, uh, so I, while I'm studying about all these things, I was trying to also understand the, okay, if it's an electrical activity that is happening in the brain, and uh, we can pick up electrical activities from all, uh, you know, all uh, sorts of things these days, including the body. Heart is also an electrical organ, and we seem to be doing a great job of capturing heart signals. 
then why are we not able to pick up these signals, these uh, brain signals from some other part of the body? And why don't we have a solution that will give us a prediction or some kind of an information about an incoming attack? Okay, so I started thinking more in those lines. And I tried to see uh, you know, what was there really in the market. But I, obviously I knew about EEGs. Have you guys seen EEGs? You put all those electrodes in the head and you measure the different the brain waves and you try to figure out the, you know, how your brain is doing. And EEGs are great. It is an electrophysiological device, so it is a great uh, thing provided someone is actually having an attack at that point in time. If not, it is inconclusive. And you cannot have an EEG at home. And uh, it is a complex instrument with lots of uh, things on your head. Definitely it's not something that even if you have money, you, can, you won't buy it and take it at home because you would need a technician and you would, nobody would keep wearing it for like 24 hours and stuff like that. So that was completely ruled out. So I was trying to understand what else could be there that could uh, you know, help pick up similar kinds of signals. So I took my research in that direction. Okay? And I figured out that okay, maybe from the hand, we could pick a very clean signal. A combination of these signals would probably give us similar insights to those that we get from EEGs. So that was one reason to explore that. On the other hand, at that time, IoT was just coming up. Nowadays, everybody talks about IoT and artificial intelligence, right? And uh, so 2014, 2015, IoT was like very, very hot, and very new, and new processes were coming out. So I started reading up about these variable processors. And finally, you know, I was able to, because I'm thinking very deeply about this problem, one day it just came to me that a combination of these sensors, if I were to able to uh, have the right kind of sensors, and if I put it in these specific places uh, on the body or in the hand, we will be able to pick up the signals that will help us to identify a seizure attack before it happens. Right? What is the implication of this? Right? The implication is that, first of all, if somebody has bad kind of seizures like my son, then potentially a life could be saved. Now, by God's grace, we are lucky. We have people at home who could, you know, I could come down, my husband would come and we rush the kid to hospital. There are people who don't know and, uh, you know, they might not take the person to hospital. Something catastrophic might happen. Secondly, doctors may be able to provide better medication if they have better insight. Right now, they rely only on EEGs to provide medications. But like I said, EEGs are not always very good. And many times, neurologists medicate based on generalizations and assumptions. Okay? Now, because of that, many patients end up having very bad uh, side effects. And uh, so, if doctors knew, if they had more insights, they could provide better medications, make sure the person is moving towards a, no, a more normal quality of life. Right? So, there were, so, I figured that you know, maybe there is a reason for uh, coming up with a device like this. But I was not sure whether I was the person I was to do this, take it to the market. And I was not motivated enough. My initial thought was that maybe, yes, I'll come up with something. And it got validated in different, uh, from, a, from a medical perspective as well as from a technical perspective. And everybody said this is a solid you know, way of figuring out the seizure and it could be a great predictive device. But I was not sure that I had the courage to uh, take it to market. 